Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include Britain must quit the EU to win back its self-confidence, says Lord Lawson. EU's first Earth observation satellite is put into orbit. Google pays EU fine for street view breaches. And EU vital for jobs, says Southwest MEP Graham Watson. Plus, pledge to free up UK jails sees just 17 EU prisoners sent home to serve time. It's a pleasure to be back and we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. The Easter holidays are over and we're now firmly into the open run-up to the European elections in May. You can bet there is going to be much said for and against the EU. And here at the unit, we're going to do our level best to keep the truth and facts flowing, helping you get a clearer picture of the European Union landscape. It's Wednesday, 23rd of April. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the unit nightly news. First up, the hot story from our website, theunituk.com. Britain must quit the EU to win back its self-confidence, says Lord Lawson. Quitting the European Union will allow Britain to win back the self-confidence it lost after Margaret Thatcher quit as Prime Minister, Lord Lawson has said. Lord Lawson of Blabby suggested that Britain was hanging on to its EU membership as a form of comfort blanket and would prosper by being able to stand alone in the world outside the EU. Interesting, don't you think, that so many of the post-commons politicians, who so often were pro-European Union during their tenures in power, appear to do a complete U-turn once they're in a position where they can do little to enact their political persuasion. What is it in the power seats of Westminster that swings our ministers like medieval turncoats from Eurosceptic to Europhile? EU's first Earth observation satellite put into orbit. The European Union's Earth observation satellite was put into orbit on Friday after a successful launch from Europe's spaceport at Kourou, French Guiana. The successful launch of Sentinel-1A, the first satellite dedicated to the EU's Earth observation programme, Copernicus, was described by the European Commission as a significant achievement not just for the Copernicus programme, but also for European space policy and the involvement of the European Union in space activities. Sentinel-1A is the first satellite of the first of six families of dedicated satellite missions which will be launched between 2014 and 2021. European Commissioner for Industry and Entrepreneurship Antonio Tajani said Sentinel-1A's brand new eyes will observe our living Earth as never before, and these eyes will be European. The data provided by this satellite will enable considerable progress in improving maritime security, climate change monitoring and providing support in emergency and crisis situations. Now here at the unit we've reported on this in the past and the Bruswellian spin doctors have done an excellent job of selling the social and ecological benefits of these satellites. For clarity and balance, we think it's important that our readers also know that this satellite network will replace US-based GPS satellite services for Europe, including observation and surveillance functions. In our legislation section, you can see the directive proposals for vehicle speed limiting and remote-controlled vehicle immobilizers, giving police the ability to shut down the ignition and fuel supply of any EU vehicle. And of course, the system goes further still, as it also operates as the command and control platform for a system of military drones similar to the Predator drones of the US, and, in addition, police surveillance drones. And we reported on the drone program already in use for agricultural surveillance, the Sentinel satellites will enable Europe-wide farm monitoring. Google pays EU fine for street view breaches. Google paid a $1.37 million fine in Italy after the local regulator found its street view cars drove incognito across the country, violating the privacy of citizens caught on camera without their knowledge. 
It's Google's largest penalty yet after a series of clashes with data privacy regulators across the 28-nation European Union. Street View cars have also triggered fines for collecting data from unrestricted wireless connections to gather people's personal communications. The owner of the world's biggest internet search engine, which had about $60 billion in cash at the end of last year, already took steps to make its Street View cars more easily identifiable and to alert people that the mapping services cars plan to pass through their neighbourhood, the Italian regulator said on Friday. Google cars roamed the streets of Italy without being perfectly recognisable, so people didn't have the opportunity to decide whether or not they wanted to be omitted from these captured images, Italy's data privacy regulator said. The illegally collected data was destined for a large database of particular importance. Well, of course, Google now has the Street View data it needs, albeit with a small additional cost, but for a global corporation with a cash-at-the-bank balance of $60 billion, then a fine from the EU for a little shy of $1.5 million is really just chump change. EU vital for jobs, says Southwest MEP Graham Watson. A member of the European Parliament says Dorset's businesses could lose out if the United Kingdom were to leave the European Union. Southwest MEP Graham Watson says that hundreds of thousands of jobs across the region depend on the EU and claims the business case for staying in Europe is becoming clear as the country prepares to vote in the European elections next month. The Liberal Democrat MEP said just last week the Dorset Chamber of Commerce and Industry came out and said how Dorset businesses have to do more to make the most of export markets if the economic recovery is to really take hold around here. Mr Watson said pool-based firms such as Lush Cosmetics, luxury yacht manufacturer Sunseeker and heat exchanger firm Heatrick could also see their international trade suffer. He said... It's not just about stuff made in Dorset. A phenomenal amount of international trade goes in and out of Poole, Weymouth and Portland's harbours, thanks to their prime south coast location. Interesting that Mr Watson chose the words international trade. What he doesn't mention here, however, is that figures for UK exports to the EU, which are reported as around 80%, are not as straightforward as first appears. Andrew, in our research team, discovered that the port of Rotterdam is used as a central freight hub and all containers from the UK to Rotterdam are classified and counted as UK to EU trade, irrespective of their final destination in the world. Pledge to free up UK jails sees just 17 EU prisoners sent home to serve time. Just 17 foreign criminals have been sent home to serve their sentences under a treaty that was intended to clear Britain's jails of mainland European offenders. Ministers had hoped to deport thousands of offenders under a European Union treaty that would see convicts serve their sentences in their home countries. But in more than two years of operation, just 17 European criminals have been removed. The number of criminals from the rest of the EU has risen markedly under the coalition, despite David Cameron promising to personally intervene to have them sent home in greater numbers. The EU prisoner transfer agreement was signed by Britain and 17 other member states and came into force in December 2011. Since then, three Belgians, a Latvian, a Maltese and 12 Dutch prisoners have been sent home. Ten were guilty of drugs offences, three of sexual offences, one for causing death by dangerous driving and one for a stabbing. Now, at the same time, ten British citizens have been transferred from other EU states, meaning overall the scheme has opened up just seven extra prison places. There are 10,695 foreign prisoners in British jails, costing around £370 million a year. Clearly, the travel expenses, hotel accommodation, wine, food and nefarious expenditure of UK taxpayers' cash has been wisely invested in forging this credible and effective EU prison transfer agreement. Back in 2010, David Cameron said he would personally intervene to make sure thousands of foreign criminals would be sent back to their home countries to serve their prison sentences. Yet, four years on, and still only a handful have been repatriated. 
One can only imagine that if Big Cheese Dave Cameroni is just as effective at renegotiating a repatriation of governance and control back from the EU, then the legal loophole enabling him to dump the proposed referendum on the EU will be straightforward, as clearly the relationship will have not changed. One must always remember that the legal frameworks of the EU operate like a ratchet. Laws and directives act in perpetuity, and repeals of legislation require unanimous 28 member state agreement, something which is almost impossible to achieve. Today in our video library, we take a look at an interview by the BBC with Marine Le Pen of the French political party Front National. Marine Le Pen's party has seen a surge in popularity across France, and there is clearly a strong anti-EU feeling developing throughout all nations in Europe. Notice where Marine talks about the European parliamentary groupings and Nigel Farage. One of the points we discuss in our public speaking presentation is this rather strange rule that the EU has, whereby national political parties are banned from representation in the EU Parliament. Instead, they are encouraged, via funding grants, to create European parliamentary groups. For example, the European Freedom and Democracy Group, this past term. This creates a clear disconnect in the public's understanding of the EU, because in European elections they see candidates identified by their national parties. In this case, UKIP, for example, which caused a landslide at the last European election, and then, from the public's perspective, vanished from sight in the EU Parliament, as it could only be represented by the EFD group. Now, the interview makes very interesting viewing, and it is clear that Marine Le Pen sees the European Union as a very dangerous threat to the freedom and democratic rights of European people. I'd like to give a quick hat tip to Lee Cox for posting this video to his YouTube channel. Our live interactive show, Table Talk, will be back on Thursday, May the 1st. We have confirmed guests, uh, Trevor Coleman, MEP, Renzo Zambrano from Venezuela, and of course the team here at the unit. We got a huge amount of feedback from our initial show, and we have to admit that we did have quite a few technical challenges, which left many of you frustrated, for which we're sorry. We're sorry about the teething troubles, but please do bear with us. We're working hard to get what we feel is a very exciting feature working smoothly for you. Now, for this next show, we will have a dedicated phone number that you can call or SMS text with your questions or points of view for the panel. And Sue Doidge, our administrator, will be on hand to take your calls and messages. To join the show as a panellist, you will need a webcam, microphone and a Google account. And we have added a new help section to our website in the resources section and full details of how you can join us as a panelist on the show can be found there. And I have included a link to the page in the show notes below. Remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, all one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions and post comments about our stories and even get involved in the shows. For all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter at The E Unit. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for The Unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>